Good evening. Welcome to Hardfire. My name is Eric Sunwall of the New York State Libertarian Party. With me in the studio tonight is Phil Myman. Phil was one of the, the brighter stars of the libertarian effort this, this election season. He attempted a run in, in Connecticut's 4th Congressional District. Uh, opposing him were incumbent Christopher Shays and Democratic challenger Diane Farrell. Welcome, Phil. Thank you very much, Eric. Pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure for you to be here. You were one of my idols uh, oh, during, the, uh, during the campaigns <laughs> here. I, as you know, uh, I didn't make the ballot uh, when I ran for Congress, so I yeah. kind of lived vicariously through you during the debates. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for all your help with the campaign. Well, I'm glad I could help. Uh, I got a, a message from you in September yeah. asking uh, for some assistance uh, at the time. I think you said you needed... Uh, some supporters to yeah. demonstrate that yeah. you, um, you know, that you were viable, so to speak. Right, and it helped that you had a following, you had a blog, and a lot of people came from there. So, did yeah. you see a response come in? From there that was, then? there was a response. So that yeah. was really key in helping you get into. It the helped debate. a lot. Well, great. Yeah, uh, you, you were fantastic in the debate. So Thanks you were the lot. star, as far as I was. Well, saying. you know, it's easy as a libertarian, right? Because you have principle on your side. You you don't have to cater to any special interest. You can just speak from your heart, and people respond to that. So, what was the response? Everybody loved it. I, I, it's, it was an amazing response. People come up after. Everyone thought I won the debates. Everyone thought I added fresh perspective. Obviously, you know, fresh face, that kind of thing. But really, people, people said, now we're finally, someone is out there is saying things we really believe. You know, we, you go to a debate. If you're going to a debate, politicians, right? You expect to hear some double talk and whatever and and bickering. But it's on such a level there that oh, look at. This is the mailing you sent out, and, and I'm not really like that. And, and then he says this, and she says that. And there's no real discussions of fundamental beliefs. Um, and when you do see someone there discussing things, what they really believe, it just puts the Democrats and Republicans in such a, you know, if you, if you just look at them separately, and you, it's like a microscope, and you look at them, and they're kind of fighting, you might think it's an important fight, but it's just bickering. If you take the perspective, the big, you know, the big In picture. In a way, when I watched it, it kind of seemed like they were ignoring you. Uh, Which well, ones did you watch? Uh, I saw the one uh, where the Green Party candidate was there. Um, I, I believe I saw the first one where you were standing in the middle. Okay. Um, the, those, those two yeah, debates, the first at least, one they, I saw. The first one, they're... If you're debating a less well-known candidate, for example, if I'm debating someone who is less well-known than, than myself or, or many such people, obviously the proper tactic is to basically ignore them as much as you can because um, the same way Schlesinger is, was essentially ignored. This is during the Senate race when there was obviously it was Lieberman and, and uh, Ned Lamont. Um, and Schlesinger was polling 5 6% or something. They both kind of want to ignore him. Mm -hmm. And if there's someone who seems to be less, you want to ignore him because any... Even if you say something negative about the person, it elevates their stature, right? So they w did try to ignore me, but in the first debate, but they couldn't because I'm landing points. Right? I thought you did an interesting tactic in, in what I think was the first debate. It seemed like you weren't utilizing your time well, and that they were taking all the time at first. But in essence, you kind of saved your time, and I you did. were able to, at the end, kind of elicit and come forth, and and it really kind of showed that you were there and you were in this thing. And right. uh, it was fun to kind of watch that tactic and root for you in that way. Uh, there, there are a couple different games like that, uh, like with with the timing, um, and, w and with different rules. There's different ways to play it. One debate, I just ended up having six minutes left over. That, I think that was the debate that I'm referring to. Th That's this, right. This, this was a different debate. Oh, this was, was yeah. Okay. It, and uh, the first debate I did, I had. They were folk, they were talking about um, you know the congressional page issues and stuff and that really has and the nothing 14th to do with the fourteenth time any. that Christopher Shays yeah. went to Iraq. Yeah, it has nothing to do with anything. Um, the the other debate, the this is, I think the third one, at UConn, um, I had about six minutes left, and uh, I had gotten in all my points and it was the last question. They were both out of time. I could have talked for a while, um, but I decided not to. And uh, one of the biggest responses of the night was I said, look, as a libertarian, I'm not going to take up your time. I believe in your free time. Take your time back. Sure. Right? And I'm the only candidate who would do that, who would cut taxes. Right? It's just, it was symbolic. People appreciated it. Um, their time management, they always went over budget as they would with any monetary You scored thing. points, too. One of, my, one of my favorite moments within the, one of these debates was... Uh, when you kind of admonished one of the talking head ma uh, mainstream media guys about the highways in uh, Hawaii. That guy. I, it was so weird. So, yeah, he asked me a question. I, 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 
he has this mindset, okay, and this is, the, 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 if we're getting into the media, this is uh, the epitome of it, right? The, he asks a question, what do we do? What's the federal solution to the highway situation? That's the question. We're libertarians. We don't think there should be a federal solution. That's right. Same way as asking us, what's the federal solution to education, federal solution to health care, federal solution to you know, backyard motorcycles, whatever the problem is. There, it should not be a federal problem, end of story. He says, no, 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 but what's the federal solution? Right? He just, it's just and this the, is a my, common assumption, right? Because this is what the two main parties he's typically the political, do. He's the chief political correspondent. That's right, and you housed him. I did. You, you turned and around for, and you, you admonished the man like he was a third grader. And the, the, the benefit, he cut me out of his segment entirely. That he evening really? he had a segment summarizing what happened, not even a mention of my name. Do you want to mention his name so in case he gets to watch this at some time? He can, Mark he, Davis, he knows who he is. There you go. Well, just so, just so he knows the, the, the disdain that we, that we hold for him at this point. I mean, he seems like a nice guy. He asks reasonable other questions, but um, and maybe it's, you know, there's this game of the media, right? They 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 need Republicans and they need Democrats who are big government candidates. They can't have, if, if imagine if libertarians were running the country, there wouldn't really be chief political correspondents. What is there to correspond about when everyone is free? It would and be happy? a whole different dynamic in terms of coverage that I don't think that they would have the tools to 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 deal with. Uh, you know, they wouldn't know what to do. Uh, I kind of witnessed that when I was watching Barry Hess debate down in Arizona. Uh, they often would ask, what's the solution here or what's the solution there? And he said, no, there is no solution uh, government-wise. The solution's free markets. The solution's choice. Right. And um, libertarians often get criticized for answering in those ways because it doesn't seem dynamic or well thought out or, you know, it, it, it's everything it, it, that you know, it doesn't make any sense to them. And it's in like, fact, it's a principle that we're trying to evoke that they don't understand. Right. And they want a solution that has to be a five-point plan or this or that because that's what they expect. That's what they, that's what they feel. That's absolutely, it's like if you're in prison and you're electing a warden. One warden says you're going to have three meals a day. It's going to be from six to seven. Then you're going to have 12 to, the other warden says I'm going to do four meals a day. It's, we found it's healthier. We're going to have peas for breakfast and carrots for lunch. And the third guy says you're going to go free. I'm going to let you out of jail. <laughs> yeah, but what are we going to eat? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, Phil, you're an Ivy League graduate, a successful businessman, a father, a uh, second generation immigrant. Is that correct? Uh, no, is I, I that immigrated you, is first. That, okay, first so you're a first generation yeah. immigrant. Uh, you're successful on so many different levels. Why did you pick the LP? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've been libertarian my whole life. Uh, if you, you can ask yourself this question, there's. I know why I did. There's, there's tons of parties out there, right? And suppose you agree with one of them 99%, right? Maybe there's some particular things you might disagree with. Even though the principles you agree with 100%, there might be some logical things you think, whatever. Why would you go to a different party? It doesn't make sense. Well, I guess the intention there is that, you know, if you really want to win, my idea is, is that uh, maybe being an independent and catering towards the angry center would actually get you more votes than the quirky libertarian vote, if you will. Uh, I, I think I read one of your articles that said that people don't have a hard time accepting freedom, and which is really what we try to offer. Uh, and, and in essence, uh, there seems to be a lot of clamoring for victory in certain LP circles. And you know, I, I, I wonder if that's even possible, number one. Uh, and number two is that holding to that principle is kind of important. Uh, that's why I was in it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm here for the liberty part of it. You know, right. uh, the liberty wing of the Libertarian Party, I guess, was probably what Howard Dean would say right. uh, in that regard. But, um, you know, that's, that's why we're in it, right? Is it that's right. <laughs> and even if you, suppose you win as a Democrat or as a Republican, um, you know, you, you likely had a lot of special interests, right? To be supported, wholly supported by that party, our special interest would be the beat up taxpayer, right? Right. <laughs> there, there, there's no special interest libertarians. Every, it's a general interest. Freedom That's is right. for everybody. That's right. Um, it, so it kind of defeats the purpose of bringing liberty to America by, for, by running from one of the major party platforms. It can be done, and obviously Ron Paul is a wonderful example of a major party candidate being a libertarian. Um, and maybe in certain circumstances that is the appropriate thing to do. But uh, in my situation, I just felt, I, you know, I am a libertarian. I've always been that way. Um, the, the, the Republicans and Democrats, they're, they're, they're the same candidate, basically. Sure. And um, my daughter just turned one this August, and, and your daughter is about to turn one this yes, January. Is. is that yes. right? Yes. Um, uh, one of the reasons I got involved was the effect that the war is having on their future 
and, and, and really the debt. I mean, these poor kids are going to be burdened with a debt that they have no idea that's going to hit them at this point. And yeah. you know, talk about some of the, not necessarily the war and the debt it, that in that regard, but the emotional impact of having uh, you know, a daughter or a yeah. family that's going to be affected by this really bad stuff. Yeah, it's like, you know, if you're single or even when you're married without kids, th th there's government oppression, fine. There's regulations and burdens, fine. But you can get by, you, you, you can, can work your by. job and do yeah, your thing, you can, right? Yeah, you feel you can still kind of live. But that's not the kind of life you want for your daughter. And, you know, people say your life changes when you have a kid, and it's true. And, you know, I look at her and, you know, she'll do great whatever, no matter what obstacles are thrown in her way. But is this the kind of world I want her to live in where you have to get permission, right? You can't just have a dream. You have to file the form. You have to get some other politicians to agree. That's not the kind of world I want her to live in. And I thought one, you know, I don't want to spend 100% of my time for uh, next 100 years trying to make a small difference. Um, I don't think that's worthwhile. I also want to live, and I think the most important thing in a, in, a, in a great world and country, the most important thing you can do to bring about liberty and happiness is to do your thing. Whatever you happen to do, your occupation, your hobbies, your passions, that's how you should live. You shouldn't be a, you know, an activist in capitalism and freedom. That's kind of, if that's what you enjoy doing, fine. But it's not something that everybody needs to do. The best thing you can do is to live your life. I thought if there was a chance for me to win and now make a significant difference, then it's worth it. But it, um, I don't want to be a friend. If you won, candidate. though, could you have made a significant difference? Yes, Do you no think? question. Would, would you try? I mean, you're, you're one, maybe Bernie Sanders and Ron Paul would go to lunch with you? I mean, what could you really do if you lunch, were in Lunch, lunch. Uh, <laughs> when people, when you, there's several things that happen. When, you, when you're on Capitol Hill and you're, you get up to speak, most of the time people ignore you, right? Congress is just full of people talking for no reason. C-SPAN doesn't. Even though the thing's empty, C-SPAN sees you, right? That's you right, <laughs> and for the posterity. Uh, but you're not going to uh, change anyone's minds. It's not like some representative sitting there, wow, he made a good point. I'm gonna... It doesn't work that way. It's all political infighting, right? But if you have passion and logic and principles on your side, and you can make a case for something, people have no choice but to turn. I'll give you an example. Shays, strong supporter of the war from day one, never mentioned anything about a timetable. We need to stay there forever, God knows how long. I issue a position paper August 21st saying we need to get out of Iraq. Iraq is becoming a communist country. We need to set a, a deadline because it um, takes the legs out of the insurgents. It's good for America. It's good for Iraq. We need to set a deadline and stick to it. It's a secret weapon that we have. I, I lay it out logically why it makes sense. Three days later, on his flight back from his 15th or 14th trip to Iraq, in a foreign soil uh, from London, he calls in to say, now we need a timetable. Because I sent it to him. I sent it to him. I sent it to Farrell. I invited them to a debate. Both of my opponents when I was running were very tepid. And almost, it was almost a bicker fest between the two. Uh, you really didn't hear too many of the issues and the ideas. And, and, and when I would talk about the war, mm -hmm. what I typically would tell people is that my grandfather served in Korea, my father served in Vietnam, and my brother served in the first Gulf War. Wow. All three of those gentlemen did their duty, but Congress never did. They never declared war in any of those instances. And that was kind of my pitch, because what I was trying to do is to is say, I do want Republican and conservative voters to consider me on that basis. Uh, I was against the war. I wanted an early withdrawal. I thought it was uh, rather brilliant on your part to say, July 4th, 2007, get out. You know, this, is, this makes a lot of sense. Um, but I, you know, they made a lot of play about the war, but I wonder how much play was actually there, you know, when, when, these, the, when you look at these campaigns and these candidacies. It's almost like we're not going to be real strong or, or, or have a lot of, uh, you know, this isn't going to be a big issue, hopefully, you know, and right. they're avoiding what probably is the biggest issue of our time at the moment, which is, uh, which yeah. is this undeclared, unjust war. Right, and now Democrats control both houses, and what? Are we getting out of Iraq? Not really. Do you, now, what, what do you see for that? Uh, uh, my thought is that you're going to see George Bush dig his heels in for about two years. Uh, the campaign in 08 is going to be who's the toughest, Hillary or John McCain. And you're not going to really see another referendum on the issue until almost the 2010 cycle. That, uh, that sounds like an unfortunate but very possible and likely mm -hmm. result. Uh, 
you know it's not that war necessarily always has to be a referendum if it's in national security interests that's what it is that was that's an interesting point uh, you're, you're a realist when it comes to foreign policy and yeah. a lot of libertarians don't necessarily accept that they want to do this hardline non-interventionist that type of thing but what I liked about your position was that you were a realist and that our interests are there we can't but act in our interests, right. and in and, and a lot of ways, your your immigration position echoed that also. Right, those are the kind of things. Yeah, it's a good, the right. libertarians will give you a hard time on that stuff. They do, uh, and I think the the principles are accurate. We we should be non-interventionist, and we should have as free immigration as possible. Uh, but what is the ultimate goal? It's that those you aren't mean, the because goals. once you're elected, there is a certain moral duty and responsibility as a statesman regardless of, of, of your libertarian principle, which is to have no state, right? No, 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 no. Libertarians, no. Well, okay. We won't take it that far at this, yeah. in this segment. But, um, I mean... Uh, it, no, but libertarian is for liberty. You can't have liberty without a justice system. End of story, right? And you can't have liberty without national security. That's what... There is a purpose for government. It's, we, we're There's not, some fields of thought that might dispute that, but I won't, okay, we, but won't, we don't need to get into no, that. No, it's fine, or, but it's not anarchy. Right? Anarchy is more like what we have now. Where well, anarchy by definition is the, the non-existence of the state, if right. you look at the Greek term. Right? Okay, fair they, enough. They, they, but they, it, what, what is closer to a non-existence? Is it something that is consistent and always for freedom and national security and make and a justice system right, consistently and stably? Or is it having uh, whimsical laws that change every two to four years? Which of those is closer to anarchy? <sighs> what we have now is, you know, it's illegal today, but it's legal tomorrow. There's and, certainly, and there's no, like, we drift, speech. we definitely drift in terms of our policy and it has to do with, what, you know, that politicians uh, are acting for their, their, their specific interest yes, at the moment. That's exactly right. And, and yeah. you know, to be stable is important. And, right. and, and oftentimes that means accepting the existence of, I think, of dictators in the world, too. Whoa, whoa, you lost uh, me. What, uh, well, you know, in a lot, it, when you look at a realist foreign policy, you know, it's saying that, hey, we don't, necessarily have to free Iraq so they can have a democracy, right? right. We can accept the fact that a dictator exists. We don't oh. like it. Right. You know, we would prefer that you didn't have it, but in a lot of different ways you have to accept that. The, that the that's what I mean by the that. The question is who's we? As a state, we should be in non-interventions, but individuals, if you don't like it, obviously you should Speak be able to. Speak up. Say yes. peace. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, send that's right. money, send that's your right. lives, send ammunition, do whatever you want, right? But it, you can't force other people to do your bidding unless there's na true national security, imminent threats are involved. Uh, you know, we're I often, about to be attacked by Iraq, I fine. often make the case that here we are, we're a country that spends 25 times more than our, our closest competitor in terms of national defense. And um, we seem a little bit paranoid, I think, because of that. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we get out into these positions in these areas that everybody expects us to be in. I wouldn't mind if it really was a national defense, but it's more like national offense. Well, it used to be called the War Department, right? right. You know, now it's called the. And then why do we need all these military bases overseas? Right? That's How does that have to do with defense? That's defense a big is issue. our you borders. Know, our know, borders are open. You, you, you know very well that if, if Germany or Japan needed to develop a nuclear weapon, it probably could be done in a day or two, right? I mean, they possess the ability to do sure. that. But obviously, they don't do that anymore because that's not where they want to be. That it's in their interest to have strong, stable economic markets and a society and a culture that doesn't do that. Um, I uh, spent some time just after the fall of the Berlin Wall touring through Eastern Europe, uh, Hungary and Czechoslovakia and things along those lines. And you probably have quite a bit of um, family uh, experiences with that type of oppression and, and whatnot like that. I'm sure your folks have a lot of interesting stories in that regard. Completely different world yeah. at that time. And uh, you really do respect the ideas and the notions of liberty and freedom when you go to a country that, that didn't really have that those types of things. And it was very poignant to talk to people and listen to people who had kind of lived through that type of oppression at that time. It was, uh, you know, that was uh, very formative for me in my younger years to see that type of thing. Is that how you became a libertarian? Ah, <sighs> you know, my dad was basically a, a Goldwater conservative. And uh, one of the things they used to tell him was that if he voted for Barry Goldwater, he'd go to Vietnam. And uh, they were right. <laughs> uh, I, I, I kind of came from a tradition of that type of conservatism. Um, I studied political science when I was in, in, in college, and, and I took it right out to the end of the anarchy stick, if you will. Uh, so um, I very deep into political theory and, and so you're ideas an anarchist? and stuff like that. 
you know, I, I really relate with the idea of, of anarchy. Um, obviously, what I found as a candidate was, as you might even call it a small L libertarian, um, but once you're a candidate, it's impossible to advocate that type of position. Uh, I, 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 I found that at, when I got married, I became more conservative, and I subsequently became a libertarian is the way I look at it. So, it's, uh, you know, uh, you know I, I, it was all well and fine to be an anarchist when I was 24 years old, living by myself, but I got more conservative, so to speak, and I became a libertarian in that regard. That, that's how I kind of develop my, my notions and thoughts. And, and um, you know, we need another party. You know, we need a party that can actually get in there and try to do something. Or and alternatively, we need fewer parties. If, we, if there were no political parties, if you're just voting for candidates, that's well, fine I think too. that was the original conception of Madison and, yeah. and that crew when they first came in. Unfortunately, uh, people like, as, as people like uh, the, the, that Bill Redpath, the, the, the chairman of the National Party will say, when you have a single plurality district where a winner takes all, what that tends to do, and I think what political scientists will agree, is right. that that tends to create a situation where parties need to develop, and two strong parties will essentially develop that's in true. order to kind of play that mechanism, if you will. Right. Uh, and that's where I see a lot of the problems. You know, I mean, obviously ballot access is another one of those types of problems. So how do you feel about instant runoff voting? Well, there's, there's some sort of solution that's got to be there, whether it's instant runoff voting or range voting. Or What's range voting? Range voting is slightly, I think it's way too complicated for the average person to incorporate or government or committee, if you will. Um, but it, it, it has to do with how you, it's very similar to instant runoff voting okay. uh, in terms of where your support goes and what your choices are and th things like that. There's another uh, option like that called single transfer voting also. So I think it would be interesting that we explore those types of things in terms of, yeah, it would have been great to have Phil Myman right up there on the top of that, my choice, right? And then, okay, I'll take Diane Farrell next, and I'll take Christopher Shays next. One of the reports I saw in the Washington Post segment that you had out was that you had a Democrat who says, boy, I would have loved to vote for Phil, right? But I didn't vote for Phil because it was, things were just too important. There was that psychology of the, of the fear of well, that, what they, would happen. That's what the Democrats right? and Republicans, they have to make you feel that each election is the abyss. And it's crazy, right? And, you know, and, and, and if you could somehow garnish that 30% or 33%, I mean, that's how Jesse Ventura won in Minnesota, right? Yeah. We need more of those types of situations. And they're very hard to find. They're rare. Yeah. You know? And I think, that, I think that despite your actual vote total, you had a lot more support than, than was actually garnished in, in, in the general election. You know, and I think that's, our, that's, that's one of our problems, you know, um, which is why I've got you on the show here to convince you that, you know, you're not a professional politician until you win something, Phil. <laughs> right? You, you okay, know, I don't want to uh, be a professional <laughs> candidate either. Well, you shouldn't rule it out, though. I mean, I'm not ruling it out, but it's, I hear it's, you. You it's get tired. Very unlikely. It's frustrating. I don't you know. mind the frustration. If, if, there's, if there's a light at the end of the tunnel, if it looks like I'm going to win, if, but that's don't something you think I if think we could raise two million dollars for Phil Myman, it would be a heck of a different candidate. No, I think or a different be, campaign. I, I think the candidate would be right. Similar. I think it'd be a very similar uh, campaign. Do you people, really? I people, mean, you're, you're, it's like you said. People knew my name. They knew who I was. They knew what I stood for, and they chose no. They said but no did to they freedom. Really? I mean, the people that you came across, sure, they're probably indicative of, of people who were paying attention and knew or whatever like that. But when you look at the general million people or whoever's in the district, did they really know who you were? And, and, and I really think that media saturation is very important in that regard. Um, so we're, we're not necessarily going to see you uh, in the 08. Uh, Shays Farrell Part Three is what almost you're surely not. <laughs> <laughs> but what can you? What, how, what, will you contribute to the Liberty Movement? Are you going to be an activist? Uh, you, I haven't decided. You, there's there's different ways to contribute. Uh, you know, like I said, I think the best way to really contribute to Liberty is to live your life. That's the best way to do it. Um, there are secondary ways. Uh, not like you, I'm passionate about writing, and I think that's one way to continue to get. It's not like there's a message that needs to be get gotten out there, but to communicate. You run a business and have a small family, too. It's tough, yeah. Yeah. right? I mean, you, you really have yeah. to real deal in those worlds, um, and that's important. Yeah. You know, but, uh, you know, it's great that you come on a show like this and you're oh, willing thank to you talk for having about me. these. It's, it's awesome. Hey, thank Gary Popkin. You know, he's, he's the guy. Who Thanks, Gary. He's the one who runs everything yeah, here and makes cool. sure it all happens. Uh, I've been on the show two times now already. This is my third time, and my third time I, I managed to be the host. 
cool. You're going to be the host next time. You're going you're to be a host the next time. That's you Ivy League guys. Just go right to the top, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my, state run, my state education just uh, it just isn't sufficient, I don't what think. To, what are you going to do? What, well, I, I, as you know, uh, I serve on the, on the New York State Committee. Uh, so I'm active within that state common. I'm also the alternate rep for um, the National Committee for the Northeast Region. Right, 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 right. Um, I'll be having beers with Bob Barr asking him why I can't smoke pot at night, you know, that type of thing, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, you know. We'll see what happens in that regard. But um, Do you plan on running again? I don't know. I, I, I flirted with this idea of, of maybe taking on Charles Schumer in, in 10. Uh, but I, it, it, it's, it would be so much work, and I, I don't know if I'm up for that work. I really got kind of kicked in the teeth when I got knocked off the ballot. Mm. Uh, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to keep trying, but to running again is, I don't know. I don't know what that's going to entail for me. Um, you know, it is a lot of work. Uh, I looked at your FEC filings, and uh, both you and I put more into the, our own campaign than either four of the candidates that, that were out there. So well, obviously, Well, Farrell and you know, Chase gave a total of zero. Zero, <laughs> that's right. Uh, at least my Democratic opponent put in about a third of what I did, you know, and, and she quote unquote is a millionaire, you know, so uh, it, it is kind of amazing that we weird. see that type of thing. Yeah. It is weird. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm going to start a show up in Albany. Uh, we're our little group up there. We'll what do kind some, of show? Like this, a public access oh, show. Wonderful. So we'll do that type of thing. Maybe we'll have you up there and uh, cool. get you out and we can play some hoops or something along that. You play too. basketball? Sure, I do. Oh, awesome. I love we hoops. have to. I love hoops. I hear you're quite a chess player, too. So uh, a little I, bit. But maybe that's we could do awesome. something like that. Uh, it's not that far of a drive to come up from Connecticut up to yeah. Albany. So oh, that would I'd be love great. to have you on for That'd a show awesome. like that. That would be great. Um, we could do it live while we're shooting hoops. We're getting to the end of the show, Phil. So if you've got anything you want to add here, um, you know, do it now. This is, this is your chance here. You know, I, I, I was impressed most of all by uh, the, 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 one of the heartwarming things was talking to students, both in high schools and colleges, and uh, their response, their passion for the issues, whether they agreed or not, they tended to agree, because libertarianism, it's the modern movement, it's, it's what young people, and what general so people... So we've got to talk to yeah. those folks, right? And they love it, their eyes light up, and it's, it's so different from hearing blah, 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 Republicans and Democrats. This is something that they can think about and understand and appreciate, and they're so focused on it, and they're so passionate, and they're so well-informed about such a broad range of issues that if nothing else, I'm comfortable that the future of our country is in great hands. Well, maybe we could do a college tour sometime. Well, thank you very much. This has been another exciting edition of Hard Fire. My guest has been Phil Myman. I'm Eric Sundwall, and we hope to see you next week at the same time. Thank you.